in 1940, Britain, USA and Germany all had radar. At the Battle of River Plate, 30 December 1939, the Graf which was um, scuttled, had radar, but the three Royal Navy battle cruisers were attacking it <coughs> didn't have radar. The um, Admiralty seemed to be slow on the uptake, not re um, realising the potential. But the uh, radar then was rather primitive. It had um, aerials of um, 7.5, then later 3.5 metres. And the um, aerials were like birds' nests or bird cages, which um, was no good for uh, um, aircraft. What was wanted was um, short metres, possibly three centimetre um, wavelength, which would give a direct beam um, and um, be more difficult for the uh, enemy to detect it and be more powerful. Well, America, with all its resources, um, tried to find the solution, and presumably the Germans did as well. But it took two men in Birmingham University in England, uh, Root and, um, um, and Randall, to uh, invent the um, various uh, cavity uh, magnetron, which gave a three centimetre uh, beam. This was fine. You could pick up um, a ship at 40 miles, a sub at 10 miles, and in um, calm weather you could even pick up a periscope. Um, <coughs> So this um, latest radar was um, adapted for the um, uh, Swordfish aircraft in 1942. Uh, and it actually um, was uh, op operative in the beginning of 1943. Um, but the trouble was this radar was so different from the previous radar and so complicated, you need trained staff to service it. So um, I joined in October 1942. And uh, my, uh, my intake of about 25 men, um, we were asked if anybody had uh, um, credits in, in school certificates in um, maths or um, physics, they would be required. So I was one of them, uh, and we, I was sent with um, about 20 of us altogether to the Plymouth Technical College for six months to learn all about wireless telegraphy and pulled circuits. At the end of the course, the um, we had an exam, and the top four, and I was one of them, were sent to Cultures for further training in the actual um, uh, radar sets. The other in the course, they had to, they went to um, uh, just radio or IFI, which is ident uh, identification of friend or foe. So at um, Cultures, I had a few months there and then went to um, 77 Squadron at Colchester. Um No, sorry, um, down in um, South. And there uh, we trained observers uh, to um, in the in new radar. It was then I made my one and only boob in the, in the Royal Navy. There was an Avaranson which was converted into a schoolroom which had about six sets 
the trained observers. And um, my job was to find all six sets were working satisfactorily. And um, uh, and I was just sort of clearing up when I saw all of the um, CO and the uh, observers coming towards me. So I hurriedly uh, disconnected from the generator and uh, connected up uh, onto the um, aeroplane's engine. So um, and then they all got aboard and I watched the plane take off. They circled around, then they landed. I thought, oh, that's funny, why are they landing so soon? <laughs> when they landed, I, I was told that I'd forgotten to put the main switch on uh, for the generator, for, for the air, air um, plane generator. The CEO wasn't too pleased, anyway. Um, after a few months and 77 squadron, I was transferred to um, 811 Squadron, which had um, a 12 swordfish. But these were marked 3 swordfish. The old swordfish were marked 2. They had three cockpits, the pilot, the observer and navigator, and the air gunner. But this um, new radar was so heavy, they had to dispense with the air gunner and they um, convert the um, swordfish to two um, cockpits. Another um, complication was that the, this new radar had a scanner underneath, which was very good. It gave um, 360 degrees survey of, of the sea below it. Um, and it had an cell on, on top of the, of the um, scanner, hence the, it was often called the pregnant swordfish. Of course, another complication was, with this scanner, they couldn't carry torpedo. So it had to rely on um, depth charges, bombs and rockets. Anyway, um, so, and then 811 Squadron, after um, um, training in, in the up and down in the Clyde, um, we were put on an Atlantic convoy on the Biter. And after a few convoys, 811 Squadron was transferred to um, a Russian convoys on the Vindex. And then, um, actually, the, uh, the weather was so bad, a lot of the um, um, swordfish uh, were so badly damaged in landing or, or not landing that uh, in the end we ended up with no uh, swordfish. And then, um, so the um, 811 squadron was disbanded. Then we were transferred to 813 squadron where we did another Russian trip on the uh, Campania and then another Russian trip uh, on the um, Vindex again. And we ended up in Scapa Flow on VE Day. Well, we thought then that we were going to be demobbed. But no. Um, um, some of us were transferred to um, a MONAB, which is a mobile operational naval air base. The idea was that we would land on a Japanese held island overcome the Japanese and um, set up a naval air base. And eight of us, eight of us were sent to um, uh, Middle Wallop RAF station for a 10-day crash course in how to operate uh, uh, handguns, Bren guns, Sten guns, with the Enfield rifles, pistols, a lot. Um, as I said before, the um, Going back a bit, the um, radar equipment, the new radar equipment, was very heavy. Most of it was a big, heavy magnet in a transmitter. It was a job to get it over the cockpit in, in its place. And you couldn't go near it because of the, the magnet with any metal objects. And we were issued with 
uh, copper screwdrivers, which I have one here, still have one. Uh, and that's the only way we could operate near the, um, the transmitter. And also, it had a, um, a crystal, which I had a, one of the crystals here that went in. Anyway, to go on, um, after this um, rather slim, flimsy uh, training, we were supposed to take on seasoned Japanese troops. There were about 400 on the uh, Monam, and we all went up to Liverpool on the troop ship Dominion Monarch, ready to sail off. But just before we were due to sail, the Americans dropped a nuclear bomb on Japan, and uh, followed by Japanese surrender. So instead of a rather hazardous enterprise, we had a cook's tour of um, New Zealand, uh, Australia, and we ended up in um, uh, Singapore, where we took over uh, an air base from the Japanese. Um, the, um, <laughs> the Petty Office mess was rather sparse. We didn't have much, um, nothing of the furniture. And then some, one of the POs said, well, in the Somi Semi jungle which surrounded the, the air base, there was a house which probably belonged to um, the Japanese CEO. And it had all the furniture in. So we thought, well, fine. So we all descended on this house and took chairs and rugs and mats and, uh, uh, and furnished our accommodation. Well, that was fine, but this, <laughs> the officer of the watch, when he came round, he found that the P.O.'s mess was a lot more uh, comfortable than the, uh, the wardroom. Uh, so the next thing was, um, we, we all had to appear in front of the C.O. And he said, uh, I know what you've been doing, chaps. Now, if you put everything back, uh, everything you took, outside the reg office in the morning, before nine o'clock, Nothing more will be said. Nine o'clock next morning, there was nothing outside the rake office at all. We all just waited to see what was going to happen. But nothing did ever happen, so we kept all our loot. So that was one bit of um, uh, looting. And then also, I mean, we didn't look upon it as looting, it was a fair game. And there were Japanese aircraft uh, in the uh, on the airfield, and so and the workshops. So we looted them as well. And uh, there was much need for radar, so we could really um, use our own time as we wanted. And I um, was bits I looted from the aircraft. Um, I made this um, uh, ammeter come uh, voltmeter, come ohmmeter, and, uh, and uh, all the bits I could scrounge, and it, it worked very well. Uh, so I had a very nice time in um, uh, Singapore, uh, and I was a dim from there in um, May 1946. Thank you.